Okay, so uh, I know Carl Kershaw, of course, uh, from, you know, lots of DC stuff and um, uh, Andy Bellinger. So you guys all came together and did this uh, new comic, uh, like imprint, uh, Lethal Comics, correct? Yeah, that's right. Okay. Is yeah, so I think, I guess it was around 2020 or 2021 when we started off, um, when we, we started this sort of thing. Uh, we'd both been working in the industry for years and years and years and years and years. And uh, I had done an animation project. And when it was over, um, you know, it, I had a bunch of money. So Carl thought I should kickstart this, this wrestling comic, this like sci-fi wrestling comic that I wanted to work on for years on Kickstarter. So I started researching Kickstarter with some of the guys in the studio here and Carl and we launched the first book and it did so well. We were like, I got paid a lot more than I do when I work for DC. So why don't, <laughs> why don't we try making this a business because we get to actually write and draw and produce our own, our own material. And, and it does pretty well. So that was sort of like the inception of uh, how lethal started. Okay. But, but well, the challenge that's... of doing, the, sorry to interrupt, Michael. Um, the challenge of doing any of this stuff is um, any creator-owned work is is that you have to find time within uh, your schedule doing um, work for hire to 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 make this stuff. And usually, it's a very very slow process, and you're looking for um, enough time to actually finish it and work on it. And Kickstarter has allowed us to do that. Um, uh to, to basically be able to fund it in a in a way that we previously hadn't been able to before so it's really exciting for us to be able to do things just as they occur to us instead of having to wait for years and years to find the right window for it yeah cool okay well i don't want to waste any of this so i'm going to do my little intro and then we'll okay. just start talking okay Hey guys, how's it going? Michael Troy here. I'm super excited today. We are talking about a great new Kickstarter project uh, from Al Gofa and Lethal Comics uh, called Orc Gym. I've seen some of the preview art. It looks amazing. It's totally in my wheelhouse. It is bright and chaotic and sick. It has a great concept. We also have Carl Kirschel and Andy Bellinger here from Lethal Comics, um, the imprint that Orc Gym is coming out through. And uh, so we're all going to talk about that today. So I guess, uh, uh, you know, Carl and uh, Andy and Al are all part of the same imprint, Lethal Comics, and they've had successful uh, Kickstarter comic books. And this is the latest venture, Org Jim, uh, Al Gofa's project. So let's introduce Al and uh, tell us a little about yourself and your Orc Gym Kickstarter project that is currently going on. Yes, hi. Uh, nice to meet you. Nice to talk to you for the first time. Thank you for Thank having you. us. Of course. Uh, yeah, so Orc Gym is, um, well, it's the title pretty much says it all. So it's essentially uh, a lot of orcs, but in a more uh, motherhead spirit, so uh, like uh, 70s EPs on motorcycles. But they also happen to be like a bodybuilding um, and taking a lot of steroids. So um, <laughs> um, those are not uh, interests I have in my daily life, but they're uh, interests I, I enjoy in uh, comics or movies. So I try to uh, um, explore this universe as much as possible and write a compelling story about them. Uh, essentially, we're following just a bunch of uh, uh, really obsessed org bodybuilders and uh, of course, like they have daily life problems. And so we're going through their, their issues and their pains and what it's like to be a bodybuilder. But of course, there's also a lot of action in it because, you know, I'm selling muscles. So there needs to be some, uh, some maybe mutant steroid stuff and et cetera. So that's org gym. Um, I don't know. You wanted to also a little introduction of myself. Yes, uh, like maybe, uh, you know, what other comics do you have out that yeah, people yeah. might know you I, from? And... I have a little pile with me. Uh, my first uh, self-published uh, comic is entitled Chevalier Bataille. And it was essentially like pork motorheads. Um, but it was a silent comic. So uh, it, it it had like uh, some, uh, some success and it reached like... Uh, an editor named uh, Piao Studio, which is a Swedish uh, micro editor who does like uh, indie work. And um, so I did my first full book, Dark Angels of Darkness. This one is in color with uh, dialogues. 
And uh, so that was fun. Then I decided to start uh, doing a publishing uh, with my own imprint called a new system. And um, it was a lot of work and it was fun. And I made two anthologies, one called uh, Dagger Dagger and another one called Cry Punch Comics. Uh, I tried to show as many artists that I really already enjoyed their work. Artists like Liana, Linia Stork or Maxime Gérin. <clears throat> After that, I met the guys, Carl and Andy, who reached to me on the internet. And they were pretty much doing exactly what I'm doing, but offering me like maybe more success, more visibility and less work. So I just jump in and offered them the comic uh, or Jim. Well, that's uh, pretty um, uh, lucky, <laughs> I guess. Like suddenly Carl Kershaw uh, approaches you and says, hey, uh, you could do more with this. I mean, um, that's- I don't, you know. I don't know if it's if it's luck so much as like, we saw, Andy and I saw Al's work. Um, I first <laughs> saw it when he, um, when he kickstarted his Cry Punch anthology. And we were like, oh my God, this is amazing. And then uh, I flipped through um, a copy and uh, it's just full of amazing, like everything about it I loved, like from the, the drawing, the creators involved, the, the paper quality, the book design, everything. And then we learned that he was in Montreal and we share a studio in Montreal and it was kind of a no brainer to just reach out. And then Orc Gym happened later. That was just, I mean, we, we were just talking and uh, getting to know each other. And then uh, Al brought up Orc Gym and we were like, this is, uh, this is amazing. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Carl and I wrote, we sit together in the studio <clears throat> and Al came in and, and started pitching us on Orc Gym. And like, as soon as he said Orc Gym, the two of us just looked at each other and started laughing. We're like, oh my God, that sounds awesome. <laughs> Bodybuilding orcs. And he was starting to talk about Arnold's pumping iron, but like if they were orcs. <laughs> and uh they're like yeah, that's like the best idea I, I i myself i was like i wish that had been my idea <laughs> it's so good it, yeah. it is like i mean i feel like because you know what i've seen from the preview uh the art is amazing and it, it it totally is worth checking out and the concept is so crazy um but I feel like it's almost one of the thing, one of those things that it could just totally sell itself on its name alone. <laughs> I mean, it's just it is brilliant. It's sort of like that, you know, secret when lightning strikes, like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles or something like that. It's like orc gym. It's like hilarious. Who doesn't want steroid using orcs working out in a gym? I mean, <laughs> I, I'm I'm so there for that. Awesome. Yeah, so are we. <laughs> yeah, in a big way. Yeah, I'm like so, alone at home drawing pages and just laughing all the time. I'm like, so it's a good time. Yeah, it's funny because um, I have to say, like you know, and um, the I feel like now that I know that you guys are all Canadian, um, that answers the question because Canadians are so nice and more generous than Americans as far as uh, you know, like the hey, this is a great comic. Let's let's all get together and work together. Um, but Al, I have to say, like reading your uh, concept of the orc gym and the steroids and the uh, the craziness, like you just seem so like polite and unassuming. <laughs> that, I mean, don't judge a book by its cover, but you know, it's like I was expecting, I don't know, somebody looking more like uh, Andy, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, I have some uh, pipes under that. Oh, like... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so how on earth did the concept come to you? And you said it is stuff that you don't do, but it's stuff that you're interested in. So, <laughs> Well, I do go to the gym, but it's more like out of um, not doing nothing and staying healthy. Uh, I play a lot of basketball and I, I kept uh, injuring my legs. So I start uh, going to the gym for that. And, uh, but the visual around the bodybuilding and the, 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 the old culture, the old history of it really fascinates me. And um, so uh, th I actually know a lot of bodybuilders and read about them. It's like I follow the sport a little, but it, it, it didn't came naturally. It's just like by accident, by like reading about bodybuilding so I can uh, not hurt myself when I, I work out and stuff. And um, so, yeah, and also, of course, because I draw comics and I've always been reading comics, like the uh, muscles are just like uh, an aspect of art and drawing that like we all uh, explore and draw. So there's a fascination for like drawing your biceps in a different angle or a pectoral in a different angle. So 
uh, org gym was just perfect for me to to draw as many muscles and all the angle as possible with sweats on it and uh, and I asked my good friend at Saint Jean who lives in France Europe but was a uh, uh, living in Montreal a few years, uh, working in the same studio as me to do the colors. And so I just think with his colors, we can kind of get a more French uh, 70s uh, sci-fi vibe to it, um, which is closer to my influences. I'm a big fan of uh, Ralph Bakshi. So uh, I kind of wanted to have a bit of that energy coming out from an org gym. Wow. I mean, I, I feel like uh, I'm so happy that I'm doing this to help support this Kickstarter because, I mean, I feel like it should be nothing but successful. I mean, with 70s French, like you're just speaking like, you know, it's like all these great words here. I feel like this is becoming an ASMR video. Like, I can't wait for this book to come out. It looks so good. Um, is it like, how, how do you, so this is the first issue. Is it, is it a one shot? Do you plan on doing more or are you going to see how it goes or is it a complete story? Uh, I, I wasn't sure yet, uh, how many issues it would be, but I've just finished writing the whole thing and it will be six issues. Awesome. Um, I also applaud you on the use of orcs. I feel like, you know, like so many things are cyclical. It's like, we have zombies, we have vampires, we have. You know, um, oh, we've never had orcs before, and it just seems like it's, it's such a no-brainer. I mean, it rhymes with dork. It's like a fun word to say. Orcs are cool. <clears throat> for for those of us who don't know, what is an orc actually? Oh wow, that's a good question. <laughs> um, well, I I think my takes on orcs. Uh, I'm I'm not the only one to have taken it, but is uh, is not the most common we're used to see. Uh, the one we're the more uh, used to see is the one in Lord of the Ring, which is definitely like a barbarian creature, practically an animal, and uh, really violent. Uh, but there's uh, some humor to it. It's just like Lord of the Ring is not really uh, comical, <laughs> but like I thought those orcs were kind of funny. So that was always uh, the aspect that interests me the most about these orcs is that like we can be clumsy and we can have fun with them. So I try to uh, not make them as like uh, the, the bad guys, but like the protagonists and like try to explore their daily life. And um, but yeah, I think orcs are uh, I, I, I don't read much of fantasy literature. I don't know exactly what people are used to see other than in Lord of the Ring, but like I want, I want to see more from them. So that's why I'm doing it for them. There's definitely yeah. a tradition of, um, of, of funny or humorous orcs uh, in, um, you know, uh, like Games Workshop, Warhammer, um, even, uh, even uh, early Warcraft. I think like that's, that, that's the kind of orc that I, I think your, your orcs seem to have evolved from that. That uh, <laughs> that branch of, uh, of orcdom, I think. Yeah, I'm sure there's a Tolkien-esque uh history to uh to those orcs but this is definitely not that yeah you're and, making uh, a good point actually um i was not thinking of them but uh there are there are actually influences it's just i i've uh, i haven't passed as much time with them because i haven't played those games but like i i definitely have like files on my computer with like uh, pictures of a uh, war armor and there's this also this um actually there's this uh, game they made blood ball is that, is that yeah, a, yeah, that's that's yeah. a Games Workshop, um, yeah, yeah, kind of Warhammer associated. Yeah, that, that's actually I really like the look of that. It yeah. has that humor to it because they're doing sport; they're not like killing each other or anything. There's also a hilarious heavy metal band called Goblicon, and uh, I think that's how you say. It. Or wait, uh, no, it's Necro Goblicon, and it's like just it's a heavy metal band, but the lead singer just like is a goblin. So it's like a goblin, like, and it, he's just contemporary. He hangs out with like the other guys, but he's just straight up dresses like a goblin. So the idea of taking, I think, the orc out of the fantasy realm and putting them into like a contemporary sort of, you know, very human sort of world, almost like, I don't know, like Planet of the Apes or something, just, it just lends itself to like so much, so much. And you don't see it very often. Right. I mean, yeah, I really like the whole concept of like, you know, just um, world building. You know what I mean? It's like, um, I, I just like, a, a, as a artist and writer myself, like, that is way too ambitious for me. So it's like, I'm always astonished when somebody like creates a whole fantasy world filled with like, you know, different 
races that go as far as like orcdom. And by the way, Carl, if orcdom is not a word and you're just going to, <laughs> I would love to give you credit for that. And that's freaking genius. <laughs> no, I'm sure it's been used before. Are you guys contributing um, covers or uh, incentives to the Kickstarter? Absolutely. As... I'm, uh, I'm working on a cover right now. Al's got some amazing ones already. Andy's is done. Um, has that yeah, one my been put online? There. What's that? Has your cover been put online already? My, yeah, yeah. Progress. I'm trying to, I'm trying to open it up here. Um, I knew we couldn't afford Joe Jusco, so I, I tried like a, a Marvel swimsuit version of a, a Joe Jusco, but for, for Orc Gym. That's what, that's what I was going for. Uh, there we go. Covers. Yeah, there it is. So that's, uh, that's <laughs> that what I did. Is beyond. I love it. That was, <laughs> it's amazing. I just remember Joe, all those I like. Feel Joe, I feel suits. Joe Jusco would be proud. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I know. I mean, I was, I was, you know, it's like I don't know how I feel about the uh, the Marvel Illustrated uh, ish superhero swimsuit issues, but I know I bought all of them when they came yeah, out. Yeah, me too. So. <laughs> it's so funny. We were talking about this yesterday, just out of the blue. I said, I said, like we should collect every swimsuit issue from every uh, comics publisher in the '90s. There was a Wildstorm one. There were Marvel ones. Oh yeah. Who else did them? Yeah. Oh, homage Studios did one. Um, mm. Yeah. I'm sure I have them. Yeah. Yeah. I honestly think they're... that uh, Al needs if there's like a stretch goal somewhere inside that kickstarter campaign a calendar has to happen eventually like, yeah. like he be. needs like a, a like the a, chippendales a, calendar of orcs yeah body oh my orcs. god i was yeah, just okay. gonna say that like i know like chippendales <laughs> one of the best like most selling like calendars the best thing about the whole chippendales uh calendar though is that um uh i just watched a documentary about this and um the first printing of the calendar had a typo on it so they had to destroy all of them and like <laughs> lost like m millions of dollars or something <laughs> crazy like that <laughs> like i think they put like 30 days in february or something stupid like that like so so ca cautionary tale uh al if you put out a uh actually that would be kind of uh epic if you if he put, did like a Chippendales cal calendar with the typo in it and like put 30 <laughs> days in February just to sort of like an easter egg for nerds like me who may have seen the documentary <laughs> yeah well does really the orc niche. does the, does this orc world take place in like I mean their calendar might be completely different that'll be True. the excuse to use <laughs> their orc holidays um <laughs> who knows how many months probably probably fewer than 12 yeah, and I, I haven't figured I, that out, but that would be funny. Like, there's just three months. <laughs> one, of, one of my famous, one of the most famous orcs, and I feel like he doesn't really get orc recognition, <laughs> is Orko from He-Man. Is oh, he not geez. an orc? Or... <laughs> he, he has to be, right? I mean, it yeah, must be is. his name. Yeah. Right. Yeah, for 100%. So. <laughs> no, Maybe no, the, more, like... the smaller they get, they get uglier. So you got to like completely be hidden, but they, they get magic if they're tiny. From Dorco to Orco or something. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> like I, I I could like I can almost see this turning into like a planet Hollywood thing, you know, like oh you could start a chain of orc gyms across the country and you know <laughs> that's my secret plan at the end. Yeah, I'm right. Starting I, know. I know. <laughs> so um I have I have just a uh, fanboy on Carl just for a second because uh, one of my favorite books ever is the new Teen Titans year one mini series that you did with uh, Michelle Wolfram, I think it was. Amy Wolfram, yeah. Amy Wolfram, I'm yeah. sorry. And um, uh, I mean, I was aware of your work, um, but I, it felt so different and just so like next level and just so beautiful and just really is just like, is so amazing. So could you talk a little bit about it for me? <laughs> oh, well, well, first of all, thank you very much. I'm really proud of that book. I, I, it's like, I think um, I was in, a, uh, I was in um, Spain recently for a show and they did uh, part of the show, they, um, in, in Avila, Spain, and as part of the show, Andy, you'd remember, they kind of have yeah. you on stage to do this, um, this kind of one-on-one interview. And, uh, and they, and it's like, it's like a, 
I, I wasn't really prepared for it because it's it's like a on a big screen behind you is like a whole history of your entire career and there's some you know some ugly stuff you got to sit through but I only bring it up because um, the Teen Titans Year One stuff came up and the guy, the interviewer, who was a really, he did a lot of research. He was a really well-read guy, actually said, now this, this is the point in your career where it seems to me that you actually became Carl Kershaw, the comics illustrator. Like before that, you were drawing comics, but it wasn't until Teen Titans Year One that your personality started to enter into your work and I I was blown away because I'd never thought of it like that but I think he's absolutely right and I think I think I'm so fond of that series because um it's the first time uh I really got to inject a lot of the humor and and um and attitude and character that I wanted that I had been wanting to do for a long time but really never had an opportunity to do so I'm really I'm really thrilled that you that you like it I'm still really is it uh Carl is it safe to talk about the animals yet yeah, I've told that story. So, so the yeah. way the way that the, that series worked is I, obviously there was a they'd done other year ones, um, and uh, and Amy Wolfram uh, had um, she had been writing the Teen Titans Go cartoon, and so DC brought her on. They hired her on based on the strength of her work there, and she had never written a single comic book before ever. So um, she had no preconceptions of how to, you know, write to that audience or what it was supposed to be. So she she naturally just um, wrote from what she knew, which was the cartoon. And I was really happy to just kind of bounce around ideas with her. And, and because she wasn't used to the sort of solitary comics lifestyle, it was a really collaborative experience. And, um, and uh, so we, we we wanted to treat those teenagers like actual teenagers, which is why they're so kind of at times scrawny looking, um, really awkward, uh, sort of pimply sometimes. Like there's just a lot of like like awkward teen stuff in that book that I've never seen in a Teen Titans book before because they were never really treated like teens. Um, but uh, as part of uh, something that was cut from the series was that, um, in fact, I think there's, I don't remember, I don't have the trade with me, uh, but um, at the end of each issue, we had uh, a two page section with, um, with Beast Boy in it. Uh, and, he, and each of these two page scenes was Beast Boy as an animal um, looking for the Teen Titans because he wanted to join this team. But um, I think the first one of those might've been published, but, uh, but uh, the editor in chief at the time, Dan DiDio saw it he must have seen it as of issue two or something, and he uh, he sh he shut it down. He cut he cut all of the animal scenes because he said uh, he said uh, that animals in the DC universe do not speak. <laughs> it was a bunch of talking animal scenes, and they were really cute. So I have a bunch of pages of those that I drew that never got uh, never got published, unfortunately. Well, I I have an upcoming interview with Dan, and I will uh, uh, chastise him for that. Yeah, ask him oh, about yeah. that for me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Happily, <laughs> yeah. Um, I heard I DC to, okay, Universe so, animals don't speak. Dan, is that true? I mean, like I, I'm like, like I almost just fell off my chair as you told that story because I, as, as much as I love like that series, like I, like I am so beholden to the Wolfman Perez Titans, and um, sure. yeah. I, I for sure like that would have been like such a great thing. Like he didn't have to talk. Was he even there, or did he did he show up and not say anything? Or the the, the or Beast Boy was, scenes? It yeah. was it was Beast Boy as an animal talking to other animals oh, who okay. also spoke yeah. back to him, and it was so just that sort of a, yeah, it was sort of a cute little thing. <laughs> but I also loved so the Wolfman Perez what? Teen Titans were were amazing, but it was so. But they were so. I mean, I was probably I was probably like the 11 or twelve when I started reading those. And they felt kind of, a, they felt like a real, like adolescent, um, like there was sort of like a sexiness to those Wolfman Perez, Teen Titans things. Like there was a lot of like love triangles and all sorts of stuff going on. Yeah, I just, it's funny. Oh, I'm but, sorry. I was thinking about, as you were describing, because I thought that was very thoughtful um, about the way you handled the, the teenage-ness of the characters. And, you know, if you look at Teen Titans issue one compared to like issue 25 or something like uh wolfman or i mean perez's style definitely changed and like he leaned out the characters and they did look 
more age appropriate, but I agree with you. It definitely felt like an adult book, Mm -hmm. but I mean, okay. So I always throw out these fantasy books that I'd love to see happen. So I would love to see you and Amy or you and even Marv Wolfman do a like Titans miniseries with the Wolfman Perez miniseries. Like you're one of those characters. Yeah, I would. I'd be interested. Like I'm down. <laughs> I'm down. Like I don't know what Amy's doing now. Um, she, I think she's still writing for animation. But uh, I, well, the entire regime at DC has changed now, so I feel like anything is possible. You know, you could throw all sorts of ideas out there, and things could get picked up. I, we, I sort of like Gotham Academy is sort of a spiritual successor to Teen Titans Year One in a way because <clears throat> it's also teens and it's also kind of awkward, but it's 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 got the the Batman Gotham City backdrop. So it's like, it's a, it's more of a horror title, really. It's like a YA horror title, but it has similar um, elements of comedy and stylistically it's very similar. So um, I don't know if you've read it, but if you like Teen Titans Year One, you should, you should check out Gotham Academy. Um, I haven't um, read Gotham Academy, but now I definitely will um, based on that description and uh, recommendation. Um, it's funny because, um, you know, like with my channel, a lot of my stuff is uh, uh, old comic books. And I'm kind of, I, f- I hate to be the stodgy person who thinks that there's no good comic books being made today. But especially from the big two, it's very hit or miss. And that's why I like to support books like Al's uh, Kickstarter or Jim and, you know, whatever you guys have going on um, with your books, because I feel like those are the best comic books coming out right now the indie books and the kickstarter books and uh you know i've just gotten so many great uh books from self-published or kickstarter in the past couple of years and i really feel um that that's kind of where it's at right now and you talked a little bit before yeah, we started. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about, you know, your decision? Because, I mean, you would think from, um, I, I, you know, a layman's point of view or like my point of view, but I, I mean, I guess I know diff- better, but it's like, I mean, you work for DC Comics. What more could you possibly want? You know what I mean? But the, the adv- advantages of Kickstarter are obvious. So uh, what, yeah, like, the, how did the- you guys get into Kickstarter and that stuff? Yeah, so we, we kind of, we knew Kickstarter was happening and a friend of mine, Jimmy Palmiotti and Amanda Connor, like Jimmy was kickstarting a lot of stuff. So he was kind of the guinea pig behind this. And he was one of the guys, he's kind of our mentor in the background when we, when we need advice for certain things. And uh, I had known Brian Polito and Brian Polito with Lady Death is just, he's built an empire through Kickstarter with, with Lady Death. He has 10 employees. He does four or five Kickstarters a, a year. He has a warehouse in Arizona. And it's all based on something that he wanted to do. And, and Marvel and DC, as much as you want to play with these characters in that sandbox all the time, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's very corporate and very limiting as to what you could actually do. So just because you, you get a job drawing for them doesn't mean you're going to get a story that you may want to draw for or that kind of thing. And so what happened was I was, I was doing a big animation job and it kind of ended and I was burnt out and all I wanted to do, uh, I I'm a part-time wrestler as well. Um, I'd been writing a comic called mother trucker about, uh, space, space truckers who solve their shipping disputes through wrestling. So mother trucker is sort of like, like wonder woman with giant muscles and, and, uh, wants to be the, the ACE trucker of the universe. And I've been writing like a re- this wrestling sort of like universe in my head for four or five years while I was wrestling. And when the animation job stopped, Carl, it was Carl's idea. Carl was like, why don't you try kickstarting it? And I, for some reason, I thought it had to be graphic novels. And, and Carl's like, no, 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 you could just do like one comic. And I was, I was kind of like, oh, that's easy. So we did it and it was very, very successful as compared to like when I launched my series at Image, uh, Southern Cross with Becky. I, I made, you know, double, if not triple what I did on that image series and, and, you know, made the same thing like double or triple what I would make uh, working on something for DC. But at the same time, it, it was all me. I was writing, I was drawing, I was, I was talking to printers about getting things like trading cards and like centerfold posters. Like I used, I loved, you know, in the nineties when you get a comic book and there'd be like a, like a Jim Lee centerfold poster that would open up. <laughs> So there was like, or, or, you know, like I just loved centerfold. Like when I was a kid, I was really into Fangoria. So if there was ever, 
you know, those centerfold fold posters that would open up. I got really excited. So I'm doing that. So all of a sudden I'm making my dream comic when it not just from writing, drawing story aspect, but also the printing and the stuff that comes with the comic. It, it becomes like this whole package that we were putting together with stickers and buttons and and, you know, all kinds of fun stuff that you would get in cereal boxes like in the 80s. That, that sort of like got really fun for me. And once that started, it just kind of, it was successful to the point where we all just kind of went, we should just build a company doing this because then we can draw, write and draw whatever we want. We kickstart it, you know, the, the, they do really well and, you know, we should just build a business out of this. And that's where Lethal Comics came from. And the idea of Lethal Comics is basically like, we're like a music producer, you know, like, you know, uh, Carl's like Metallica, I'm like Megadeth and Al's like Anthrax or, you know, and we're all sort of like under one um, umbrella helping each other promote because that's the big thing with comics is the, the promotion for the actual individual creator just seems non-existent in today's world. You're never going to get the stars that you did with like Todd McFarlane and Rob Liefeld and all those guys that were in the nineties that did image. <laughs> Have there been, has there been anyone that was a star that much since then? No, no, absolutely <laughs> not. Cause the marketing isn't there for the creators through the companies. I know. If we, I mean, they kind of went, Oh, if they're going to be cowboys and go off themselves, why would we promote them? So the only way to really do this is to kind of like, you know, start promoting ourselves. And if we can help each other promote our, ourselves as a, as a crew under one label, we can help grow the, that audience. And um, it's very exciting. It's so much fun. I don't know what you think, Carl. I, I'm loving it. It's, it's really fun. Yeah, for me, it's, it's, um, it kind of feels like, uh, like the indie landscape right now kind of feels like the way the web comics scene did in the early 2000s, where like, you know, you'd, we were so uh, focused on mainstream work that, that um, well, when we started, Andy and I started doing our own web comics in 2007, along with a bunch of other guys that we were sharing a studio with. And then I started paying attention to what was actually happening in that field. And uh, it was just full of incredible talent, of the likes of which I didn't see in mainstream comics, um, like different styles, different voices. And that's what, that's what this kind of like Kickstarter era feels like to me. It's just like, you just look around and find like a hundred different interesting looking projects from artists you've never seen or... Uh, or heard from, and uh, it's really exciting. And and we can and and the the nice thing about it is that it's like you can. It feels it's like literal patronage of the arts. You know, like you can you can an artist can flirt with an idea and and kind of follow their muse with a bit of a safety net. Not that Kickstarter is a guarantee to anything, but but it's more of a guarantee than you know just kind of trying to like squeeze it into like your off hours while you're you're doing your drawing Superman or whatever. And, and just praying that uh, you don't go broke doing it. I don't know. I, I just find it, uh, I just, I find it a, uh, to be a really exciting time to be making comics. And in a way, it's kind of like an, uh, a good middle finger to like um, the bigger companies, you know, who, you know, like uh, Andy was saying, like, don't celebrate the artists anymore and don't promote them in the same way uh, because, you know, people talk with their money and, you know, it, you're putting out a book and it is a success on Kickstarter. So that proves your value or your worth or your artistic merit to, you know, to, to people who want to see it. So, I mean, that's good. And then, of course, there's the fact that, you know, when you do a Kickstarter, you're the one who reaps the benefits. You don't have to share it with anybody. And, um, you know, so I think it's a good thing. I think it's definitely... I. You know, I, I I think that Marvel and DC, um, uh, you know, uh, are definitely should always be around. I, I love their comic books. I mean, they're obviously probably why we all love comic books. Um, but I do I do think that they shouldn't take things like comics and art and characters and writing for granted. You know what I mean? I, it makes me sad that, you know, Marvel makes like millions of dollars off these movies, but they won't pay creators like top rates for their pages that because comics don't sell, but it's like, but you put so much money into promotion, aren't comic books just promotion in a way for movies, if nothing else than the fact that it's like 
they're still ripping off Chris Claremont stories from the past, you know, 30 years or whatever. So it's like, if, if nothing else, they have their value in that. If you get what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah I, I don't, I, I never, I mean, I, I'm, I've never had a chip on my shoulder about it, I guess, you know, like I, I, like I work for Marvel and DC and I work for some video game companies sometimes. And I, I, I still feel like personally, um, I, I just kind of like walk a line straddling all these different things and just kind of go wherever my whims sort of take me, wherever my, my creative focus happens to be. Some, I think they all have their place. You know, like I've done books for Marvel and DC. I've done a book for Image. It's also creator owned. This is just a different avenue for me. Um, and I think of like those guys are businesses, you know, like I, I, I don't begrudge them. Um, well, I mean, some of the practices, like, you know, it'd be nicer if they, if there were like current page rates, like, you know, better rates and, and if people were treated equitably and whatnot, but um, they're going to run their business like a business. And I just feel like if you don't, you know, if you don't want to be a part of that, it's very easy to just kind of do your own or easier than it used to be to do your own thing, which is why I think we, we gravitate toward this. I know. I mean, you know, let's face it. It's like, uh, uh, I, I would draw the X-Men for free if they called me tomorrow. You know what I mean? It's like, well, it's like <laughs> you get that stuff out of your system, you know, like I, I, I did it for a bunch of years and now like, I still, you know, I drew some Batman last year and then I got it out of my system. <laughs> you know, like, it, yeah, I, you'll, I, read, you'll be like, Oh, I really it. love Spider-Man. I want to draw Spider-Man. But then you do, you do like a cover, you do a short story, an issue or two or something. And you're like, okay, that's, that's good. I'm, I'm good now. And now I can just spend the next several months working on my own thing until you have to scratch that itch again. That'll never go away. I don't think that itch will never quite go away. I mean, I think it's smart to do both if you can, you know what I mean? Like who doesn't want to be able to draw Batman every once in a while or Wolverine or Spider-Man or something. But then, you know, if you're, yeah, I feel like most artists do and writers and creators do have their own stories to tell and should for sure. But yeah, like, but if, you know, you know, you do a Batman book, then that brings an audience to your, you know, creator on stuff. So it's, that's like, seems like the best of both worlds and such a great way to do it. I think it was around 2012 or 2013 was my first time going to Heroes Con. And when I went, Heroes Con has this amazing uh, feature in it called Indie Island. <clears throat> and uh, I wasn't seated too far from Indie Island. And I remember going around Indie Island and at that show, I was sitting next to Ben Mara, who was this crazy and uh, like really awesome indie artist. He has probably like the funniest comic I've ever read called One Man War on Terror. It's the funniest comic book ever made. I swear to God. But I met Ale Alexis Zirit there. I met tons of creators like uh, uh, Jim Rugg and uh, Ed Pisker. And I met a lot of these guys and they were all part of that indie island. And none of them had a Marvel and DC style. And up until maybe like two, three years ago, there was a house style for both places. Both places had a very, very like heavy house style. And if you didn't draw in that style, you're pretty much not going to get hired. But that indie island, all of a sudden I saw tons of artwork and it just like, my, my, my mind was blown by the, the styles like Aaron Connolly and all these guys were just doing the most energetic, crazy artwork. And I was kind of like, why, why is there no magazine or publisher for these guys? Like these guys are, are blowing my mind. And then to, to loop it back around, when Al came to the studio and he brought us Cry Punch, Cry Punch felt, felt like that, that feeling I had all over again. It was like it was like Al was publishing this book that that had all of these guys in it that, that reminded me of, of those guys in that in that time. And I always thought if ever there was a, 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 a publisher to, to be new, they would go after those guys because they do such rad work. And like, uh, I, I don't know if you have Cry Punch it, but you uh, some somewhere after this conversation, you got to get Al to send you one because it's awesome. It's. Here it is. Wait, wait one sec. This is it. Look at this thing. It is that looks gorgeous. Very it's cool. super oh, thick. Wow. Newsprint. <laughs> it is like one of the most beautiful, beautiful like books ever. And Al just like hit it out of the park with this book. And wow. it felt like there, like there should be a publisher just for this stuff. It's, like, and that's all Al stuff. 
Yeah. The, it's Al, Al and his friends. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Al, you, put this, you put this thing together. How, how did you put Cry Punch together? <laughs> a lot of emails, a lot of emails and a lot of like a, a really gentle artists with faith uh, in me that were like, oh, I'm going to be you one day because, you know, Kickstarters, you never know how it turns out. Um, but uh, it went really well. And uh, yeah, I just, I just, yeah, it, it was a lot of more emails than I thought and a, a lot more uh, organization. And I won't like make a speech about uh, working in front of a computer, but uh, it's a lot of work. So I'm glad to not do it ever again and let Andy do it. <laughs> but uh, <Yeah>. <laughs> having said that, it was, a, it was a very humble and inspiring experience because I realized how much work editors and uh, publishers have to do. So uh, I, I liked it. I'm, I'm glad I've done it. And all these artists, uh, I'm hoping to like collaborate with them in many ways, trying to make new variant covers or maybe short stories um, because they're all, all my favorite artists. And like, come back to what you guys were all saying, like I, I, I don't see them at DC or Marvel. Uh, their style is not fitted or maybe it's just a thing, a matter of career. A career. Like have, uh, being a job man is like, is a different skill than being good. And uh, like, I don't know, like those youngsters don't know how to get a job at DC or Marvel. Um, there's this girl who, who was in my two anthologies. Her name is Linnea Steyr. She, uh, she lives in, somewhere in Scandinavia. And um, she's so good. She just did a swim thing uh, drawing for fun on Instagram. And it's literally the most beautiful swim thing drawing I've ever seen. And like, I, I know she's not gonna get it to Bishop DC. I know it's just not gonna happen, but she's amazing. So. Anyway, so there's a lot of talent out there, and most of them are doing Kickstarter. Actually, Linnea Astor is doing a Kickstarter with uh, Simon Roy. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Simon mm -hmm. Roy. Oh, yeah, Simon's awesome. Yeah. So um, what, how big is, is it? I, so you said Orc Gym will be six issues, and this is issue one. How many pages will it be? And 30 what, to 34 pages uh, each. Yeah, yeah so... Um, the comics we print are about 40 pages, like for the printer. So I kind of said, as long as you can get it between like, you know, 30, 36 pages, and then you got like an extra page for, if you want to do a letters page or, or put in like, you know, uh, pinups or fan art or whatever, though, that stuff's always fun in a comic. So yeah, as long as they're 40 pages, um, you know, and then, then the covers, it's ready to rock, but. This is the first time I'm hearing that he has six issues. So I'm uh, super pumped about that <laughs> because if Al, if we're all running uh, a series, I'm running a series, Carl's running a series and Al's running a series. That's great momentum for the next couple of years to, so to what, come out uh, with Kickstarters. What is your series and at what point is it at? Um, I'm doing Mother Trucker and I am in, I'm about to start the third book. So the second one just went out and I think I have, so this is, uh, that's like a, that's pretty blurry, but that, this is the second, uh, the second mother trucker. That logo is epic. I love that. Yes. That looks so cool. Oh my God. Yeah, that's I, amazing. An artist named Drez 13 out of Miami does all my logo work. And yeah. I don't know what it is, but when it comes to doing like an eighties, you know, Saturday morning cartoon logo. That guy is just the king. He's he cr he crushes it every time. So, so in the cover um, and back cover are painted. Yeah, that's my work. Yeah, yeah, awesome. And the yeah, but the work. editor that looks so cool. Yeah, and then I mean, Carl does covers every time. And um, here, there's a here's an ad for for Carl's series Tanninger. Wow, this looks so cool. Feel free to send me all your books to review, guys. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I'll send you a pack. I, I'm 96% shipped on uh, Mother Trucker 2, and then Mother Trucker 3 is happening in March. And uh, we're wrapping up an anthology right now called Cycle Gorman. It was based on the, the movie that came out in a year and a half ago. And uh, that has something like 35 creators in it. It's going to be like a heavy metal magazine style. Oh, cool. uh, a magazine that will we'll send you that one too it's almost finished nice so cool and uh carl what's your uh series and where's that at 
That uh, the one I'm going to kickstart soon, probably in uh, mid February, around shortly after Al launches, is called Death Transit Tanager, and it's a sci-fi series. It's actually a black and white story that I drew during the pandemic. Uh, that's issue one, but I'm working on a color backup for it now, and it'll be uh, probably. F- it's kind of an ongoing thing, but it'll probably be. I'll probably do a run of Kickstarters that are for about like five issues or so. Um, oh, actually, here's the cover. This is this is a color version. Of, I don't know if you can see it of uh, of that. Uh, Very cool. Cover Andy held up. So I'm working on more covers. Um, I also ran a Kickstarter for my web comic collections. It's called the Abominable Charles Christopher, which is a um, kind of a animal talking animal humor web comic that I've been doing for many many years. Uh, so that's what's coming up from Kickstarter right now. I'm drawing uh, an orc. I'm drawing an orc lifting weights. Nice, <laughs> and that's uh, that's gonna go. When I finish it, I'll send it to I'll send it to Al, and you can you can forward it to you. Um, I'm my go to my go to um, uh, inspirations for these are basically just like mustaches and headbands. That's what I'm thinking. Like, uh, <laughs> yeah, orcs, orcs stuff, with mustaches awesome. and headbands. <laughs> Yeah. That would almost be a great title for a book itself. Mustache. Please, chapter two's bands. title. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I realized after I finished my cover that the, the main orc with the mustache and the mullet um, flexing is like the like spitting image of my stepfather. It was oh, really geez. creepy. Can like, I analyze he, that? My stepfather left when I was like 18, but he was like British and he had that mustache with the with the 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 flat top and the mullet. And after I finished like took me like a few weeks and I was like oh my god it looks just like Steve <laughs> See, who, who needs therapy when you can work out all your issues <laughs> and variant covers <laughs> yeah, yeah I'm, is... I'm really I'm really excited for Al's book it's the coolest title it's the coolest concept I was jealous of the concept like straight up when he told it to us it was so funny I was like oh <laughs> Well, he told us, he told us the title and we were like, like, oh, this is amazing. And then he spent the next 20 minutes explaining every character to us and their motivations and their connections to each other. And we were like, what the, this this is the greatest (laughs) comic. (laughs) So is this like, uh, Al, is this like orc planet? Like everyone's an orc or are they interacting with humans or Uh, or other, other It's mostly just orcs. (laughs) Sorry, what? Other fairy folk, like trolls or... (laughs) Well, uh, it, there there will be another uh, ethnicities, uh, which is uh, dark health, but they uh, they will appear later on, and they have a small role. But otherwise, it's just orcs. But uh, now, is it, is that necessary for like a social commentary kind of thing, or they no, just no, it's just there. Uh, I just wanted the most badass um, possible uh, guys uh, coming from another country or something. So I was like, yeah. well, those, those dark elves, I'll put them in tuxedos. Like white tuxedos, long white hair, and like black skin. I thought they would look like super edgy and cool, and like, and they will be super skinny too. So they will be in big contrast with the um, the green orcs that are super muscular. So it's more of a visual thing. But uh, I feel like uh, you should have a bucket sitting next to you so people can just start throwing their money at you because <laughs> I can't wait to read this book. It's gonna be so good. Like. Thanks. <clears throat> Yeah, I'm planning to put a bucket outside. It's a good idea. Yeah, I mean, I'm already envisioning the Netflix series, to be honest with you. But maybe, I just maybe think... those dark, the dark elves make the steroids. Like that. Well, I, I don't, well, I don't don't give ideas. <laughs> Andy, 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 but they are drug dealers. Idea, they are drug Andy, dealers. Deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> maybe in uh, Mother Trucker. You can uh, work out your well. I mean, uh, oh, your, well, mother trucker has steroids too. Mother trucker is all about steroids, but they're called burgeroids, and they're they're <laughs> just in the burgers. That's why that's why they're wrestling on top of a burger. That's just oh basically a burger of steroids. That's yeah. insane. I don't know. It, I feel like Carl Kershaw might be the normal person here. Are there are no like, steroids yeah. in my book yet. So. <laughs> you need steroids. Yeah. Can you put some steroids in your book? I yeah, know. I can try. <laughs> Actually, there's actually there the... is uh, there's drug use in the first issue in this backup story I'm doing. There we go. There it's a bit dark. <laughs> there it's... Thank you. There we go. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, 
they, they, so these guys sound a little um, what, uh, you know, like the kayfabers might call like outlaw comics in a way. I mean, I guess they're not that extreme though, huh? Uh, what's like, is this a mature readers kind of book? Uh, mine's very mature. Uh, I, well, I, 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 don't, I don't have sex. <laughs> I don't have sex in my books yet, but there is yeah. definitely <laughs> nudity. Like Mother Trucker tries to like, it's, it's like the, the lone wolf and cub thing. She like, every time she gets into a wrestling match, she'll like, like her shirt will fall off. And like the other wrestlers will be like, Oh, and that's when she gets over on them and beats them up. But she's a, she's a, she's a nineties girl. She got kind of like rebuilt after, you know, years of being in a, in the, like a, a, a kind of like frozen, like Captain America scenario. So before that she was in the nineties when everyone was rude and now she's in a time period like now. So, Whenever she like whips off her top to beat up a guy, the crowd is like, oh, boo, call the cops. I'm going to throw up. This is disgusting. <laughs> cancel her. Cancel her. She's always getting canceled in my book. <laughs> oh, my God. I love that so much. Yeah, that is so like, cool. Everyone hates it. They're, like the referee throws up. <laughs> like, like, like her top comes off and he's like so shocked he, he hurls. <laughs> it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's strange how things have definitely changed since the 90s. You just can't get away with that stuff anymore. <laughs> yeah i guess that's like that's what that's kind of what we're why that's another reason why we went to we went to uh kickstarter is is a lot of the mainstream is very ya right now they're all kind of like you know in a ya mode so when i was growing up i remember being like mark bagley spider-man and like todd mcfarlane and then i i guess i was 12 and I, i'd gone to my local comic store and like saw simon bisley's like painted heavy metal covers in the back that I wasn't supposed to, you know, buy. Right. I've always been one of those kids that wanted like, you know, the cookies on the top shelf I'm not allowed to have or that feeling uh, when I got into heavy metal magazine and then heavy metal magazine was just like a gateway into me reading European comics um, like Mobius and, and Monero and Serpieri and, you know, uh, Libertoria. And then I just like, from then on that it was, it was, American comics for me were over. I, I only read uh, European comics for years. So when I joined the studio with Carl, I actually had to play catch up with, you know, Alan Moore and Frank Miller and all those guys. Cause I, I didn't care about their work. I was only buying heavy metal magazine and I was only reading European comics because they felt like edgier. I felt like the artwork was better. And then when you become an American comic artist, you realize, you know, they do a page a week and we have to do like six or seven, you know, it's just like a different schedule. So that's why their comics look like theirs and our comics look like ours is, you know, they, they do, you know, well, we might be doing 180 to 250 pages a year. They're doing like, you know, like 60, you know, they do like a page a week or whatever. I so, know it's kind of, kind of amazing though. Like, like, you know, uh, I grew up reading comic books like in the eighties and nineties, I guess. Um, and, uh, you know, how monthly comic books that, you know, it's like, it's so crazy that they had the same creative team, you know, on a book for like two or three years with maybe a fill-in issue or two, um, you know, but I feel like it, that helped, uh, you know, build uh, the comic book superstar, you know what I mean? It was exciting to come back every month and get Paul Smith on X-Men or get, uh, you know, John Byrne on Alpha Flight or Fantastic Four or whatever, and you're just never going to see that again, I feel. Yeah, I, I think that's gone. Like, the whole reason I stepped into that store was, like, I got to get this guy, I got to get this guy, I got to get this guy, you know, I got to get this Sylvester X-Men, I've got to get this, you know, at the time, it was like I had to get Bagley on Spider-Man, I had to, you know, there was so many that that I was, you know, it was there for you were there for the artist and you were there for the writer. Yeah. Like anytime so Jim Lee or Claremont did anything or like I was just in San Francisco for that San Francisco convention and Jim Lee was sitting next to me, but I met Carl Potts who got him into Marvel and did all his layouts in those early Punisher war journals. And I used to like, I have two of those Punisher war journals that Carl Potts wrote and laid out like on my phone with me all the time. Cause I steal from it all the time. And it, they were like some comics when I was a kid that just like burned a hole in me. Um, and then, so when I got to the show, I, I 
I didn't bring them with me. I, I meant to. So I ran around and bought them all again from little vendors and got both guys to like sign them. And uh, course, I felt yeah. like a little kid. Cause I don't think I've gotten something signed by a creator in like 10 years. You just, uh, you, as a creator that runs around, you just don't care or they're your friends. So it's like, you, you don't bother. But like, this was the one instance I got to talk to Carl Potts for like two hours about comics. And I was like, Oh man, I'm going to just be a nerd here and go back to like when I was a kid and buy these comics and get them to sign them. <laughs> uh, Carl Potts, it's funny because obviously he's more known as an editor, but he's such an amazing artist. I had a uh, Carl Potts uh, X-Men women uh, poster in my bedroom when I was young. It was, uh, I think, Rogue and Kitty and Storm by the pool in their bathing suits. And like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. It was like speaking the swimsuit issues. And then in the in the window in the back, you can see Nightcrawler spying on them through the window. And then you can see Wolverine's uh, hands coming up like, like he's coming out of the pool, like on the ladder and his claws are extended. And then oh, you I can gotta see, find this picture. I think like Colossus' hand grabbing a towel. So he worked in the X-Men anyway, but it's like a gorgeous, gorgeous piece of art. It's really cool. He's been working for like, I think a decade on this like war thing. Like his, his, his dad, I guess, was in World War II and met his mom like in Okinawa or something. And he was like, he's been writing and drawing this crazy thing for like years and years and years and years and years. And it's like the artwork is, is gorgeous. It's, uh, yeah. it's really, really cool. Yeah, he's pretty amazing. Yeah, but it was fun talking to him. It was really neat because he was, you know, he went from artist, then writer, then editor. And right after those Punisher World Journals, he became like one of the head editors. And then after Image started and everything fell apart, he was one of the guy, one of the casualties of that and lost his job. That's a shame because, uh, you know, I... I I feel like it wasn't, you know, um, as obvious, but I, I feel he really brought a lot to the to the Marvel, you know, canon, like with Marvel uh, fanfare and stuff like that. Yeah, um, totally. And if I had my choice, no offense to Jim Lee, but I'd much rather talk to Carl Potts. I, like, I just feel like I would just <laughs> have so many more questions. <laughs> uh, and he is open to chatting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah we, uh -huh. we just like, like, Eventually, we just were like, okay, we're in a conversation. We don't even care that there's people here. <laughs> yeah, I know. So, you know, well, that's like a lifetime opportunity. You know, it's so great yeah. to like, um, you know, doing this channel, I've gotten to interview uh, some of my heroes, like Wendy Peeney and um, Eric yeah, Larson. We started on, on Wendy Peeney. She's like a yeah, no pers personal hero. Yeah, those, well, those I almost, my first comics, my gateway comics were uh, ElfQuest. I almost brought it up earlier because of the fact that I was going to say I can't go through a whole conversation about orcs without bringing up ElfQuest because surely there must be some orcs in ElfQuest somewhere. But um, yeah, I truly love her and she's an amazing person. She's a beautiful artist and um, when I was young and going to the first comic book store, um, you know, aside from 7-Eleven or the newsstand or whatever, that was one of the first indie books I discovered. And it just sang to me from across the comic book store and that beautiful, gorgeous uh, cover. Like, I don't even know if I realized it was in black and white because it was just so beautiful. And her brushwork is just so amazing. And yeah, ElfQuest was definitely one of those life-changing comic books for me. Some of the best black and white comic art I've ever seen. I mean, no one talks about her enough, but I just I just finally completed the collection of all those Warp Graphics ElfQuest books because I had a few when I was a kid. I, you know, find one or two at a comic shop later because it was like the 80s. Like they, they were, I think the series had been done. I was collecting them when they were colored and reprinted through Epic. Um, but I finally got all the black and white ones and I was just looking through them not long ago and they're just marveling at the just incredible page design uh gorgeous brushwork beautiful figure work and and the writing like it just feel it, it's just so substantial you know there's there's a lot of writing on those pages but it all feels like it's just like an amazing tight story and and it's what i don't know it's just a lot of bang for your buck you know like i Has al gone down the, the elf quest rabbit hole yet al have you gotten into your elf quest yet well, not as much as you guys, but I do. I'll, uh, I'll bring a book. Give me a second. I don't know if you guys have that version in English, but in French, it looks amazing. <laughs> yeah, I think I've got them all here. I do. I'll write this um, 
Well, you'll, if you don't know already, Carl, you'll be happy to know that um, Wendy kept every single page of her ElfQuest art. Oh, yeah. And it's, it's actually now on display in New York at, I think, a college or somewhere. I'll, 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 I'll let you know. <laughs> they are, they're here, right here beside me. Look at this. Wow. All of, the, mean, all of the warp graphics of course. Are those just not amazing? I mean, that you know, I, I yeah. just love the packaging on those. I love the back covers. When a will looks amazing. Yeah. Those are just beautiful. I, I mean, think of it a lot too now in terms of um, what we're doing with indie comics in that like, I, uh, so my dog's all over me right now. But um, my dog's in my lap, uh, so don't worry. But they <laughs> they were they were released quarterly, right? Like I think uh, like that that whole quarterly subscription well, model that's... seems like such an awesome Sorry. model. Yeah, and it's something you could kind of approximate with Kickstarter. It's kind of the kind of the same thing, except um, you're being paid up front, sort of to do it. Yes, and actually, uh, 2023 marks the 40th anniversary of ElfQuest, and they have some fun stuff coming up hopefully soon. So, yeah, I mean, anybody watching who doesn't, uh, isn't familiar with ElfQuest definitely needs to check it out. And yeah, it's funny because I, you know, you speak, you, the art is amazing too, but I, I really think, like you said, like so many of the, just her way with words were so beautiful and so many poignant moments and so many quotes just stick with me to this day. So, I mean, that's mm -hmm. like the power of comic books right there, right? Yeah. What do you want? I couldn't find my uh, ElfQuest book. That's a shame. Oh! Sorry, guys. But uh, it's because, like, uh, the Europeans, is, uh, Human Humanoid Associate, the people who publish uh, Metal Orlin, French mm -hmm. heavy metal, they always make bigger versions. So we have these ElfQuest, but like bigger, and they're all uh, the way they print it. Like, I think it's a uh, mistake, but like, it looks like they're animation color cells because they didn't scan the original. They scan like, I don't know, the comic or something. So, but it looks just like the most gorgeous thing I've ever seen. It looks like I'm watching a Ralph Bakshi movie on VHS. Yeah, uh, I was going to say, but, when you described the Elfquest. photocopying, it sounds, it sounds like a Bakshi rotoscope kind of exactly. style. So it's actually this one version of ElfQuest that I have is like one of my biggest uh, uh, influence in terms of uh, ambience and tone. Okay, well, it's, that shows the power of ElfQuest. We're all... We're all affected. Andy, are you uh, uh, in, into ElfQuest? <laughs> I haven't gotten into ElfQuest as hard as Carl, that's for sure. But I have a ton from when I was a kid. I definitely yeah. bought a bunch. Um, but I, I haven't revisited it. And I've been kind of like saving it. So and now that I know Carl has them all, I'll make him bring them to the studio. Yeah, it's funny because um, I... It's weird though, because like I, I, I guess it was the '90s. I mean, I was too busy clubbing or something. I sort of, you know, uh, the comic implosion. I sort of got away from comic books in a way, and like didn't really follow ElfQuest. Like I haven't read the final quest yet that came out, and um, I'm not emotionally prepared to read it yet. So <laughs> I will get to it. Awesome. I actually yeah, I'm, petered I'm, out at like during at halfway through Siege of Blue Mountain. I just stopped. I don't know what it was. I like I missed an issue or two. And then I was like, ah, oh, I got to catch up. And then I just never found them. And then I just never actually don't think I read anything past there. Yeah, I think that might have happened to me. But I, I've, I've since collected like uh, a few of the series. So I'm, I'm going to make up for it. Um. um so, uh, so what other comic books, uh, is, you know, artists do you guys, uh, are, you know, got you into comic books or do you hold dear to your heart, your influences? Um, well, uh, I had, um, well, I have many, of course, but uh, here we go. This is like the biggest debate in our studio. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, well, art uh, is so subjective, so this should be uh, a good, good, uh, topic. Um, <laughs> I had the tendonitis for uh, three years on both both arms, and um, I couldn't like draw or work, or so I was just like at home. And uh, I really start digging into a comic artist that I had not a, 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 a the reflex to go towards to back then. I was in my early twenties, and uh, I discovered uh, more truly uh, Alex Tut back then, and. Uh, 
even if like from a superficial uh, point of view, Alex Stott is not something that attracts me. It's really like Americana, really like superhero. Uh, from a objective, well, in my opinion, objective formalistic point of view, Alex Stott just like blew my mind because I really took the time with him. And he's now like just my biggest influence all the time. I always go back to him when I have questions about like composition or like layouts. He's just uh, a huge inspiration for me. And uh, then, of course, like uh, coming from like, uh, well, in Quebec, like we, d we don't read like a lot of comics. Like, of course, we do have them. But like what's the most common? It's like mangas because we get French translation from Europe. So when I was younger, I just read a lot of Dragon Ball. So that has been a huge influence and it never really like went away from me. So if you take like Moebius, Ralph Bakshi, Evimetal and mix it with Dragon Ball and Alex that like you should get like something like I'll go for it. Like, Ideally. <laughs> well, that's a crazy combination, but cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, uh, that's pretty much like, of course, after that, I could like name like just a 30 or 50. Like I have tons of comics at home, like all of us. And there's just so many out there that are really inspiring. Uh, just recently, like one of my favorite, uh, just die, uh, Jason Pe Pearson. Um, he has like amazing work and uh, his lines are just some of the most uh, and, uh, and uh, they're like it looks like nothing at first sight because like they're very like uh, there's something modest and follow up about his work I find but like it's just so hard to replicate and it's so well constructed he's like really like a genius to me he's like in the top so, um, yeah there's just like so many great artists out there. yeah Jason uh, was one of my absolute favorite artists and actually a personal friend and I'm, I'm so upset about his loss and He's just such a great, unique artist, um, and um, I there'll never be another one like him. Um, how about you, Carl? Uh, who were some of your uh, comic book influences and heroes? Um, oh, many. I um, well, actually, my my biggest influences, aside from Wendy Pini in comics, uh, were were outside of comics. It was actually. Um, the uh, the uh, Robotech series in the eighties <laughs> that was um, that was made up of like uh, the Japanese shows Macross and uh, Southern Cross and and Mospita. Uh that was a huge influence on the way I drew and the way I told stories and uh, and it still is. Um, but uh, after that, like the the biggest ones were like um, Bill Sienkiewicz. Um, and Frank Miller, like that. Like when I was when I started like post ElfQuest, when I started exploring, like you know, frequenting comic shops and like checking out comics more uh, religiously, that was the stuff that um, attracted me. That I pulled up shell. Electra Assassin was a big one. I remember finding a, an issue of that on a spinner rack and taking it home. And it was like way over my head at the time, but I didn't care. I just loved. Uh, I just loved the. Um, the artwork and story so much and then like i was like a huge mark for all of like the 90s like all of like the the image guys you know like that was like um that was really what got me into um into it's, it's when i set my sights on comics as a career it was when i saw what jim lee and liefeld and mcfarlane and, and um, all those guys were doing um both both in the way they drew and 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 in the way they had decided to branch off and do their own thing. So, so um, I spent a lot of time, you know, drawing like that. And then like slowly, like more uh, Japanese stuff crept in. Um, I don't know, there's just so many influences over the years. Mignola is a huge influence. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I haven't too, named any of the mission. guys and they're all influenced for me. So it's, just, it's so yeah. hard to not, there's just so many talents. Yeah, but... and your, your work just changes so much. Like these are like, like you know, you could probably pick apart all of our work and see like, oh, like I'm drawing knuckles because of the way I, you know, I liked this or that artist, or I'm drawing this nose because uh, the, this way, because of, you know, like they're just little, little pieces of influence in, in every part of every drawing. Yeah, I was going to say, I feel like, um, especially comic artists and comic art, it, you know, it's like you always pick up little things, uh, you know, oh, that's a cool way to draw smoke, or that's a cool way to draw, you know, this, so you incorporate it. 
And I always say, and many, many times, any artist worth their salt uh, incorporates uh, Kirby dots into their Kirby crackle into mm-hmm. their art. Like, I just feel like it's such a staple of comic book art, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? Superhero and, comics for sure. Yeah, my holy trinity is is Mobius at the top, then, then Kirby and Atomo. Those are sort funny. of like my, my three favorites. It's funny you should say that because uh, uh, sh- showing, uh, you know, hearing everyone's different influences, um, you know, Andy, yours uh, being the, you know, mostly influenced by not, you know, superhero art and stuff. Uh, like, uh, they always say that even, even the biggest art snobs or the people who hate American comics always cite Kirby for as a hero because of his genius. It's like, how can you not, right? Mm-hmm. how can you not just like the, the amount of when you hear how many comics he produced a week and in a month how many pages you're just like that's not human like it's, like, not, it's human. not human to make that many comics in a week or a month but then just the prolificness of <clears throat> of how the style like progressed over time into this weird picasso-ish thing with like for me it's like I like Kirby Crackle, but for me, it's all about Kirby tech. Like Kirby tech is like, I feel like I'm looking at abstract art from, you know, from like the early sixties or, 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 or fifties. Like it really feels like this wild abstract art thing to me. Like, and especially those football pieces that he did, like that he did for the NFL. Yeah. Do you remember that you've seen those? They're, you know, they're wild. They're wild. Yeah. They're so crazy. Yeah, I've I seen, love that um, stuff. There's a good video on YouTube somewhere. It's like a half hour long, all about his like collage art, and it's pretty uh, epic. Like, just yeah, it's it's funny because you take an artist like Kirby, and it's like he went through this huge period where he did all these collages because he for himself, you know, he needed to entertain himself. And I think it's funny because you know somebody like him was so prolific and. I feel like, you know, he definitely came from the era, you know, he had to draw to pay the bills and, you know, that was a big motivation for him. Um, but, but it, but it, the artistry of it is still there. You know what I mean? It's oh, not, yeah. it's, I mean, you know, it's like the, the huge debate over like S- Stanley's contribution to creating. I mean, if nothing else, one of his biggest creation contributions to, uh, the Marvel Universe was not standing in Jack Kirby's way, just sort of letting him go nuts and do everything that he did, you know? Yeah, pretty much. You will have been, I, like, an amazing contemporary artist. Like, you imagine sculptures and huge painting of Jack Kirby? He was, like, he was definitely a storyteller, but he was, like, foremost, like, just a wild mind with visual ideas that, like, most of us don't have. True that. Yeah. Really. <laughs> um, are there any other projects you guys want to talk about before we wrap this up or um, anything we should know? Um, the Kickstarter is starting in February. It will be live by the time I, when I put this up. Um, I mean, obviously uh, uh, the book looks freaking amazing. So I have high hopes that it's going to do so well. And you should be like really excited and proud about it. So, yeah, we are. Well, I am excited, about <laughs> it. <laughs> having a lot of fun, and I feel like the guys are inspired too. So it's motivating to not be uh, alone and having some uh, people supporting you. Believe it's me. gonna yeah. be it's gonna be an exciting year here because it's gonna be, you know, Al going with his Kickstarter, then Carl going with his Kickstarter, then me going with a Kickstarter. And we're going to try and do two or three each, I think, this year. And then it, it that's just exciting to, to have, like, that momentum inside of, you know, this little crew is going to be really fun. You, you talk about Jason Pearson just passing, just listening to, like, the sort of, like, Facebook eulogies by, like, other Gaijin studio guys um, is, is wild. Like, Stelfries had one last night that was just, it was, like, poetry it was is beautiful but just talking about how hard they pushed it themselves and i remember when carl and i were, were doing web comics with raid studios and he was 
we, we were all doing web comics. There was like seven or eight of us and the energy like you get from everyone else producing a lot and trying to produce their best is very, uh, it, it's a, it's an, it's it, a feeling. It, it's hard to put into words. It's very exciting. It's, and connect, it's kinetic. It's palpable. Completely it's kinetic. It's fun. <laughs> it's, you know, you're, you're looking at someone else's work and getting really charged and it makes you want to work harder. And based on the system that we're in, there was no way to monetize or, or make money for that web comic stuff we did back in 2007. But for what we're doing, we can. And if we, if we keep it up for a few years, we could really snowball into like, you know, doing really well for ourselves and, and you know, expanding. And hopefully it becomes contagious and other people want to do it, you know? No, I us, think so. congratulations. And I think that is so awesome. I think that's a perfect example. Like I, I love the studio system. I think that, you know, like growing up as an artist, um, my brother was an artist as well. So we spent, you know, our summers like drawing in our room together and comparing art and stuff. And I just think that you're right. Like you just feed off of each other's energy. You get so much inspiration. It is so cool to like go show what you're working on to somebody else. Um, you know, uh, I was briefly an inking assistant um, at Top Cow and I got to go into the studio and that was like one of the most amazing experiences of my life just to see like, you know, art and process and see people sitting at their desks and working and just... You know, I, I just think that, uh, you know, that speaks to uh, the output that you guys are doing, because I, I feel like, you know, it, like you, you said, you know, you're juggling three different Kickstarters and stuff. So it's like you move on to the next one, you can support the other person. And so it's a very great communal kind of feel. Once again, Canadians are just the nicest people ever. I just love Canadians. I do. And I and I have comic books to thank for loving Canadians because when Alpha Flight came out, I was like totally in love with Alpha Flight. And I was like, being Canadian must just be like the best thing ever. And then I discovered that they have ketchup flavored potato chips. And I was like, Canada is like utopia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's pretty good. I mean, we're in the we're in the 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 it's the insane amount of snow right now. So a lot of people don't like that part. Uh, oh, there's that. Um, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, but um, yeah, that alpha <laughs> on a side note, someone asked me to, to be the voice of Wolverine in some sort of alpha flight project coming up. I have a meeting about it on Monday. I was going to say, I have to get said, my, my yeah. Wolverine on. I think he just wants my Canadian accent. <laughs> What's that a boot? <laughs> Yeah, what's that <laughs> Bub. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, Carl did that for me. He, he brought me to Wildstorm and in bringing me to Wildstorm in that trip, I got my first published gig with uh, Wildstorm DC then doing Friday the 13th. And it's because he did the same thing that you're talking about going to Top Cow. He brought me to Wildstorm and I got my first gig at that, that trip. That was really cool. Um, well, it was so fun talking to you guys really cool um to meet you all and i love all your artwork it looks so amazing i'm so excited and happy to support uh orc gym coming out um it's going to be a huge success um and i look forward to um southern oh i'm sorry mother trucker yeah mother mother Tru i'll send you after after we get off the the horn here i'll send you uh the digital copies of mother trucker for you to check out and awesome you can I'll do the same thing I'll, I'll send you i'll yes. send you the, the pdf of my first issue oh cool and what is your book again a sender this, this one's called death transit tanager <laughs> <laughs> that's quite a quite a mouthful huh? yeah i have a hard time I usually just shorten it to tanager but uh anyway that's what it's called so it's and it'll be out uh yeah next month kickstarter i'm just prepping the kickstarter page right now it's all hands on deck for Orc Gym. Yes. We'll see head on Orc Gym. Orc Gym. Let the Orc Gym revolution take over. <laughs> I mean, I haven't even seen the incentives yet, but I'm just like, my mind is going crazy with like gym t-shirts and all this stuff. I don't know. Anyway, it is going to be so cool. It looks so great. I mean, I want the toys. <laughs> we need toys. Like, we need toys big time. For yep. sure. 
So, um, Al, any parting thoughts about your work, Jim, before we wrap this up? Uh, well, it's for everyone. Everyone who loves uh, muscle or not, it's like, it's, uh, it's, it's, everyone is welcome to read it. Uh, don't be intimidated by it. Uh, that's pretty much it. That's funny. There's something there, you know, like the, the intimidation of going to a gym just got worse because now it's an orc gym or I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, there's a, I was watching a lot of documentaries about bodybuilding before like really uh, getting my mind right, wrapped about it. And uh, yeah, there is, there is different culture, different gyms. So there will be a bit of that. I hope like a real uh, uh, amateurs of bodybuilding will read or, or gym and not feel like I'm a tall neophyte uh, writing it because uh, yeah, I'm going to try to express those different cultures. Awesome. Did you watch Pumping Iron? The Of course, but I've seen course. that one many times already. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> All right. Well, Al, Carl, Andy, thank you so much. You guys uh, continue success with Lethal Comics. Everybody needs to check them out and support them. There'll be links everywhere in the video so you can find these guys and support their work and um, uh, make Orc Gym the biggest success of 2023 until, of course, Orc Gym 2 and, you know, <laughs> Mother Trucker 2 and all that good stuff. <laughs> Thanks and, for having and, us on, Michael. It was, yeah, uh, thank you really it so was much. my thank pleasure. You very much. So nice to meet you guys. Thanks so much. Yeah, nice I to really meet you appreciate too. it. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.